All right, uh, let's get started. Thanks everybody for joining the Zoe system demo. We have a number of uh, presenters today. The uh, first one will be, uh, let's see, Kevin from the Zoe CLI, and he's going to be talking about uh, summary of enhancements. Okay, right. I'm going to share the screen. One Let's put this in a full screen. Okay, I'm just going to cover the new functionality that has been added uh, since. Um, the 2.0 release of the CLI 1GA. Yeah. Okay. Um, first one is uh, extensions to the files command. Uh, we have several new commands. There's the view data set and the view USS file. Uh, these are very similar to the download option, but instead of creating a, a file on your local host, it will spool the output uh, to your terminal. Um, the next one is the view all spool content. Uh, this is also very similar to the existing jobs view command, but instead of having to specify individual file IDs, um, you'll get all files associated with that specific job ID. Um, and again, that goes to the, that gets directed to the terminal. The next one is uh, submit jobs from a USS <laughs> file. That is, again, similar to a submit jobs from a data set, but this, in this case, you can specify a uh, USS file instead of a data set or a sequential file. And you'll get the uh, response back from the um, either delayed response or you can just tell it that it was submitted and you'll, you'll get the reply back. Um, next one after that is the, sorry. Next one is the delete all jobs. Uh, in the previous version of the delete jobs command, you can always delete a single job at a time. Uh, this one allows you to delete all old jobs associated with the ID by default, or you can specify a prefix uh, if you want to delete jobs that are not the same <laughs> as the associate, like do not start with the same uh, um, name as the user. And the last two we are going to actually do a demo of is the... Uh, CS files download data set matching. This allows you to download multiple data sets and sequential files using a pattern or a wow card. And then the last one is a compare data set, which allows you to do a compare to the terminal between two data sets. And that I will turn it over to Timothy. He will do a demo of the data set matching. Okay, uh, thanks Kevin, I'll share my screen. So hopefully uh, you, uh, you all can see it. And as Kevin mentioned, uh, we added a download data sets set uh, 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 matching command. So we'll be able to download all data sets matching the pattern that I specify, and it should make uh, bulk download of data sets uh, 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 more convenient. So first I'm going to show the uh, uh, web help for the uh, 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 new command. There are a few significant <laughs> options I want to uh, call out here. So for the a, a pattern uh, that, that you specify. Uh, we support the same syntax as you're probably already used to for um, for matching data sets on a ZOS. So we support uh, the percent symbol star as well as a, a double star. And then as you can see here, it's also possible to specify multiple patterns separated by uh, commas. And then some other options I wanted to uh, mention here, you can specify a separate a list of patterns that that should be excluded. So the first one would of course be everything you want to include, but maybe you want to exclude a subset of that. So you can specify additional patterns. You can also specify an extension map. So uh, this is a, a comma separated list mapping data set HLQs to file extensions. So for example, uh, if you want to download um, any data set that has CNTL as one of its uh, qualifiers, or specifically the last qualifier, uh, then it will be uh, 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 mapped on download to have an extension of a .dcl. So you can uh, uh, control that with this extension map. Then the uh, fail fast option, what that's going uh, uh, to control 
is with its uh, default value of uh, 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 true. As soon as a download fails, uh, the command will stop uh, right away and report uh, that failure, um, uh, just so um, it doesn't um, uh, let if you're downloading a large number of data sets, we assume that would be the uh, uh, desired uh, 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 default behavior that you find out about the failures uh, right away, rather than having to wait until all your data sets um, uh, like it's set for one uh, succeed to download, and then you find out about the error. But you can set that to false, and it will go ahead and try to download everything that it is able to, as well as the max concurrent requests option. So we uh, default this to just one to download data sets uh, in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a sequential fashion. And we already supported this option on some other commands, like for downloading all, uh, 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 all data set uh, members. But it's especially useful here because uh, it will probably speed up the uh, 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 download to be able to do multiple downloads in like a parallel. Uh, it's just something to be aware of that if you make too many concurrent requests to ZOSMF, you may overload the API. And that's why we still default it to one. So um, now I'll actually show uh, using using this command. I'm just going to run it with the uh, default options to show uh, the behavior, and I'm going to try to download all of my public data sets. In this case, it should come back with a response uh, pretty fast, since fail fast, uh, the default value, as I said, is set to be true. And there are three reasons why a download may fail. Uh, as you can see here, if I have archived data sets, I'd have to go and first unarchive them before I'm able to download them. Also, if I have an unsupported type, which in this case, I have some ZFSs uh, um, and uh, the core Zoe CLI uh, without extensions does not support downloading VCM data sets. And then a third type of error that I, um, that I, I might encounter is any um, error caused by uh, the ZLSMF REST API uh, uh, which like hopefully that would never happen, but uh, sometimes it might, and we also uh, 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 will handle and detect those appropriately. But in this case, um, I still want to try to download the, uh, 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 the remaining data sets. Uh, it told me that it found uh, uh, 16 total and only eight of them failed to download. So I should still be able to download the other eight. So I'll do what it suggests here. I will rerun the command with fail fast false to go ahead and download uh, the rest. I'll also add on the end uh, 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 the max concurrent request option. Shorthand is just MCR, and I'll tell it download five at once to speed it up a bit. And now um, the folder that I was in here uh, is the same one I have up on the uh, right. You can see it already started to download. Uh, it already started to put them into uh, 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 folders. So for example, uh, the CNTL data set, all the members have been uh, 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 downloaded, and it's now uh, moving on to download more. Uh, some of the data sets are, 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 are rather large, so it is taking a little while, but now I can just let that run in the uh, background and I have a convenient command that can download all the data sets for me. Uh, and one thing I did want to mention uh, real quick is uh, if you download the latest version of the CLI that's out there uh, uh, today, uh, you won't be able to run the command exactly as I've shown it here because the name is data set matching singular. This is a, a typo that we already have a pull request out to fix and we should have that updated by end of day. Uh, and now you can see uh, it did download successfully the eight data sets that it was able to and then still reported on the ones that uh, failed. So that's all for my demo. Uh, I'll turn it back to Kevin unless there's any questions. Hey, awesome demo. I have one quick question. Does it work with sequential data sets as well as PDS members? It does. Yeah, I probably should have sh uh, shown that here. I think all these ones happen to be. OK, uh, yeah, no problem. I was watching the MyBall. It looks like they're yeah. all PDS members. Yeah, and um, great demo. I always love watching people demo because I picked up something you did there that I've never seen before, which is that you can type in a CLI command and then even on that individual command, do the dash dash HW. And it opens a web help, but then it zoomed directly in on that. That was a nice touch. I'm going to use that on all my customer demos going forward. Thanks for showing me that. Yeah. Sure. You said this does not work with VSAM? 
uh, uh, that's correct. Yeah, uh, we don't really have um, a way in the uh, uh, core CLI, as far as I know, to download a VSAM a, a, a data set, but we'll support a binary data set. It's just that their type would have to be either like like a sequential or a partition data set, and not uh, some other special type, like for example VSAM or like a ZFS. Mm -hmm. Now you could definitely you know like uh, mount the ZFS, and then you could download its a a a uh, 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 contents if it, like if they mounted into a USS directory. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Thank you. Great demo. Yeah, yeah, but Rose, just to big up the Zoe conformance program in the uh, Zoe ex, ex, Zoe CLI conformance program, which allows vendor extensions to plug in. I think there's 28 different vendor extensions right now with CLI conformance for V1 perhaps slightly less for V2, there, there is at least one, possibly two vendor extensions um, that allow you to work with vSAM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's see. The next presenter is that Kevin? Yes, I've got it. I'll grab Control Mac, and I will start by showing the same help. But this tape is in the context of the compare command. Uh, this one is a little different. I guess we had to add some new options because I think this is one of the few commands where you specify two different data sets. Uh, you have two provisional examiners for data set one and data set two, and it can be a sequential data set or uh, a member inside a, a PDS, and they can you can mix and match them. Um, but you also support independent options for both files. So we have a binary, like if you want to transfer in binary mode, you have a binary for the first file, a binary two for the second file, similar with encoding and record format in Volseer, um, just so you can specify independent options for both of them. Um, you can also remove the sequence numbers from files that contain them so that you get a more useful compare between the two files. And by default, it will show uh, all lines in between the two files, whether they're uh, the same or differences. But there's a context lines option if you want to reduce the output to only see the differences or a certain number of lines around the differences and the differences themselves. So that makes it a little easier if you're looking through a big file and you don't really want to see what changed. Um, and the rest of the options are going to be the standard from the similar to the other commands. Uh, and then let me show you with the output. Switch over. And let's go back up. This is this is just an example with no options uh, to sample live members that IBM ships. Uh, and the, the, the fields in white are uh, lines that did not change. Uh, and then the red and the green is between the different differences. Uh, and in this file, you can see, if you look at them, some of these lines hey, are actually- hey, sorry to interrupt. I think for screen sharing, you're sharing your browser. We can't see the file list oh, with the sorry. differences that you're talking to. No worries. OK, OK. Let me, I thought I was sharing my own screen. OK. OK. There we go. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah, let me start it from again. Let me do it clear. Uh, OK, so here's command with no options, just two data sets or data set members, I should say. Uh, here you'll see that uh, it shows you the context. The, the red is the lines that were removed, the greens are what was added, and then the uh, lines in white are uh, lines that did not change between the two files. Uh, but just in this example, you can see while the text is the same between these two, it's flagging them differently because they actually have different sequence numbers. Uh, or actually, that's not a good example because <laughs> they're actually different. But you can see that the change activity one is different. So if you want to eliminate that, uh, you can actually add on a no sequence number option. And that will give you a, a more a better compare between the two because it strips off the sequence numbers and then com only compares the actual file content. Uh, so you can see truly what changed within the file and ignore the sequence numbers. Uh, and if you want to reduce the output even more to only show the, what changed, you can add on the uh, context lines option. 
And if you say zero, that won't show you any lines that are the same. And you can specify any up to any other number if you want to uh, just reduce the output. I'll say zero. And that'll only show you what changed. And it tells you, it does tell you how many uh, non duplicate lines there were in the section that was cut out, but then it only shows you the lines that changed. Now, this was the first pass uh, for this functionality. It only supports data sets and data set members at the time. Uh, it is going to be expanded to support USS files, uh, comparing between local files, data sets, USS files. And it also, in the future, will support outputting to a browser. But this is the this is what is in the current release two two. Questions? Should I have to get back to the Yeah, that was awesome. I have one question. Um sure. what, is it possible if you um do like response format JSON or something, so you get it back in structured form, is there a way to then see which lines without seeing them colored coded axes having like a tag of of the difference between lines so you could then pipe it to something else and do what you were describing which i think is to then programmatically um i'm trying to remember that is that, is that rfj i think response format json is there we go and sorry <laughs> if i put you on the spot there but i wonder <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah maybe, yeah it's still going to show you it's going to look like this you're going to see uh you'll see the plus and minuses Actually, let me turn it off without the C points down there. So let's see how it works. Yeah, you can definitely output it to JSON. But... Okay, so you could then pipe this or open it in a browser or do something and yes. you know which lines are great. Awesome. Great demo, by the way. I love the suppressed sequence number thing. I thought that was a really nice touch in this. Yeah, that's actually something that, yeah, if you ever use the IBM's ISPF version, you cannot do that. It kind of makes it hard to. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, I've, I've been an uh, awesome feature. Great job. Thanks. Oh, let me go back. I think all I had then was uh, sorry. Oops. Yeah, I guess I, I guess all I had then was Q and A. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? <laughs> Does it work with USS or just data sets? Uh, currently just data sets. USS is in progress. It oh, coming, awesome. It, it will be coming soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Timothy and Kevin. Okay. The next uh, presenter is Raj Preet, um, edition of Libraries Resource. Just uh, share my screen. Okay, so this is in regards to the Kix extension, and we worked on adding a new resource for the Kix extension. So just going to the next slide here. Uh, a bit of a background about this request. We actually had a user request to have a libraries resource added for the Kix profiles so that we can sort of see libraries and data sets that belong to a specific region um, of a Kix profile. And so if I just go ahead and show it on the extension development host, which um, includes the changes that have been made. Um, and if I go ahead and just refresh the Kix view and expand the first profile and the Kix 01 region, we can see that there has been an addition of the libraries node. Um, and then expanding this, we can also sort of go ahead and see the libraries. And another different format that we have employed for libraries specifically is that you can actually go ahead and expand the individual library uh, to view all of the data sets that belong to this. Whereas for programs and transactions and files and tasks, we sort of have it so that you can just see the programs and there isn't really ability to expand that just because it's not really efficient to do that there. But um, for libraries, it's, it's nice to sort of go ahead and expand the individual library to then sort of see the data sets that belong to um, this region for the libraries. So as per the sort of technical side of things, uh, we just had to go ahead and add the Kix library tree a file for the actual node. Um, and then for the specific libraries, the Kix library tree item, and then Kix library data sets for, to view all of the data sets that belong to this library. 
which of course um, is being done through the CMCI REST API and that's how we retrieve all of this information. Um, so sort of just an addition enhancement that we added to the resource um, was the ability to have the user click on a command, show attributes, when you right click a library or a data set. Um, so here the goal is just for the user to have the ability to click on show attributes so that they can um, go ahead and sort of view all the attributes that belong to a specific library and a data set. So if I show that here, um, and so I just have this library open, but if I go ahead and right click on DFHRPL and I click on show attributes, uh, we can sort of see this page where we um, are able to search for attributes or just view them and um, the specific values that belong to them. And this is for the DFH RPL library. I can also go ahead and do the same thing with data sets. So if I go ahead and right click on a data set and then do show attributes, um, we can then retrieve all of the attributes that belong to this data set. Um, just like, yep. Yeah. All right, and then um, as well, so this is again, just sort of in addition to the resource itself, uh, providing search filter functionality for the library tree. So here um, for bigger systems that might have more than one or two libraries, the user can go ahead and locate to the search icon just right beside the library's tree node. And we also have this for the other resources as well. So if you go ahead and do this, then, um, and you apply a filter. So in this case, if I just go ahead and apply the star filter and just because I only have one library, uh, we will sort of just retrieve that library back. And then I can also go ahead and clear the filter um, as well. And then we also have the count here for the libraries. And again, this system only has one library, um, but for larger systems, it might be useful to sort of have that search filter functionality for users to uh, locate specific libraries. All right, and then uh, as per this fix, it's not directly related to the library's resource, but um, this one was also sort of brought to our attention by a user and it's, regarding an error that was sort of showing um, with not having the ability to load specific regions of a Kix profile that require authentication. So um, if I show the current version, um, I'm connected to the WinMVS 2C system here. And if I just sort of go ahead and expand that. And it, so it is up and, and running and I can sort of see the green circle here. So we are connected to the system, but um, none of the regions actually load. So we're not able to sort of see that one region that belongs to uh, the WinMVS 2C system. But with a fix um, of in the session object and by adding the type equals to basic and just sort of specifying that the connection that we're trying to make has basic authentication um, and passing that parameter, we were able to fix this issue. And now if I go to the extension development host, um, so the fix, and if I go ahead and expand the WinMVS2C system, we essentially can uh, get back the region that belongs to this system and then go ahead and expand it and then sort of see all of the resources that belong to this region as well. Um, so this was an issue with just not passing in the type parameter uh, in the session object, which we then sort of pass on to um, just here uh, for getting the resource. And so it was failing to do that just because the session object didn't have the um, type basic parameter being passed in. Um, all right, so then, so yeah, so that fix sort of led us to um, have the ability to sort of view the resource um, that did belong to a region that requires authentication. So essentially, username and then password. And then, um, yeah, so that's sort of everything that we have added in the Kix extension, which will be um, implemented in the next release for Kix, which is uh, this week. And that's everything. Yes, yeah, so if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Hey, Raj, Pete, that was great. What I love about both of those, they both came directly from customers. One, unfortunately, was a defect where they couldn't see their data, but it shows, and the number of downloads has gone up really nicely now. It's now 1,270. And I think the last time there was a system demo, it was only at just past 1,000. So it's gone up by about a fifth in just the last sort of eight weeks. Um, awesome job. A plus one for me. Just a quick question. It seems as though the actions that that you can, well, maybe there's only one. Maybe it's just the show attribute. But that that right click really just allows you sort of view only type 
activities, right? You're not allowed to manipulate those data sets. Right, yeah. Um, so we did sort of add in the, actually, let me just, uh, sorry, start sharing my screen again. We did add in the ability to enable and disable a specific library, but then we met with, um, we met with a member who's very proficient at the Kix extension and they recommended that we remove that ability. So if I go ahead and expand on the libraries here, and then if I just right click, we did have the ability to sort of enable and disable the, um, let me just, and I just sort of locate to the critical status here. So, oh, sorry, no, this one, enable status. So we did sort of add in the ability to change this to disabled, um, but after sort of having a conversation, um, essentially the suggestion was that we go ahead and remove that. Uh, so we did end up removing the functionality for the user to go in and then disable the enabled status and then so forth. Um, but so for libraries, you only really have one sort of, you know, command that you can choose, which is just show attributes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but Raj, a great scenario. Can you just expand programs really quickly and new copy a program, for example? A any program will work, yeah. And then oh, the, the... Uh, probably this one. <laughs> we need one you authorized a new copy, yeah. So, yeah. so here you're affecting the, the region rows. And if you right mouse click, you'll see it says library DSN, which will tell you the library it was loaded from. What you mm -hmm. need. So it's, it's a thin line. What we don't want to do is create a system programmer tool. Right, VS right. Code is a development, it's an IDE, and we want to make sure servers, Rad said we met, it was actually Israel Gross from Rocket, who's a very good, you know, kicks, best of the best sort of, um, you know, share presenter, um, educator, educates developers, and he he's actually helping us push this out with developers and developer training courses. We want this to be a developer tool. The second we walk into something that's at the main, the mini of us, system programmer, we cross the line and we want to make sure we don't do that because he's worried that then that wouldn't be, that people wouldn't roll it out to developers because it might be too dangerous. Sure. So we walk that tightrope all the time, but great feedback. And if we're perhaps too safe, there are things that we can do. The API allows us to do a lot more, but we're just surfacing the, the developer use cases. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Great job, looks fantastic. Sir, uh, can somebody provide a link to document this uh, demo timetable? I think we had a hard time hearing you. Yeah, can you repeat your question, please? And sir, can you provide this uh, link to the document with uh, demonstration type demo? Um, yeah, and you, you saw it in the beginning. In the beginning of this. Do you mean? Um, do you mean uh, a link to the agenda of this uh, system yeah, demo? Yeah, agenda. agenda. Okay. All right. That yeah. That that page might be limited. I I'm I can you know I'll put it in the chat, but I'm not sure you'll have access to it. Uh, let me just do that. But um, what you will have access to after the call is I will um, put uh, the meeting recordings in the uh, Zoe Slack channel, so you'll be able to rewatch this recording. And I mean, for sure, the agenda will be in there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, also, thanks, Nick, as well. I posted the link to the github.com slash Zoe slash community. And what you'll see there is all of these recordings for all of the releases are uploaded. So you can always go back and see them. And also all of the Zoe documentation, which is linked from Zoe.org, um, also contains links to all of these recordings. They're all archived and collected for you. Thanks for the question, good question. All right, uh, moving on, the next presenter would be the web UI and uh, I think Lenny, you're gonna present the ZIS plugin. All right. Um, yeah, hello. Let's see, share screen. 
um, uh, right, I'll be presenting the uh, automation of the ZIS plugin install. Um, I haven't been on uh, presenting on a system demo in a few versions now, so it's nice to get back into things. Um, and let me begin with this doc page here just to kind of refresh people's minds a little bit about what the cross memory server is. Um, when I'm referring to ZIS plugin, it is a plugin that uses the cross memory server. And that, what is that? That provides privileged cross memory services to the desktop and runs as an APF authorized program. The same cross memory server can be used by multiple Zoe's, uh, multiple desktops. The cross memory server is needed to log into the desktop and operate various apps uh, that need privileged access, for example, like the code editor. And if you wish to start Zoe without the desktop, for example, like if you want to bring up just the mediation layer, you do not need to install and configure it. Uh, the main uh, components of cross memory server is going to be the load module, the parm lib, and the proc lib, and various configuration that comes with that. Um, so, the purpose of this demo is to showcase the automation of ZIS plugins, uh, more specifically the ZWE components install command. So I'll log into my terminal here. Um, so how do we specify that our component now has ZIS plugins? So firstly, we add it into our manifest. Uh, so here I've got a manifest of the editor the editor does not have ZIS plugins, but um, I have a few sample ones for demo purposes. So I added this section right here. We're specifying the ID of the plugin and the path. The path in this case, ZIS server. So if we uh, view the directory of Zlux editor, we'll see we now have a ZIS server uh, folder and we have our load lib component and our sample lib component. And um, the uh, this demo is showing how we can load keys to our uh, Parm lib member. So in our manifest.yaml here, I mean, sorry, in our zoe.yaml, our zoe configuration yaml, we're specifying our parmlib, which is right here, and then our parmlib member, more specifically the zis parmlib member, which is right here. So whenever I do the zis plugin install, our zis keys are going to be loaded in this parmlib ZIS, ZIS Parmlib member. And um, so we can run our ZW components install. So I would do something like this, just my regular component install. Um, and then we specify our Zoe configuration YAML. And then the directory or the packs of our component we want to install. So something like this. And if I run this now, um, it'll just skip over it because I already have the Zlux editor installed. But uh, if I didn't have it installed, it would have 
a additional info message that would say ZAS plugins installed. And now if we go over to our Parmlib and then we view our ZIS Parmlib member, then we'll see that our ZIS plugin keys have been installed. Where are these keys coming from? If we go back to our ZIS plugin component and we open up our sample lib component, that is where the keys came from. They were loaded into our ZIS Parmlib member. I'll show that again here. Um, and uh, in addition to this, we also added uh, special key handling, more specifically keys that are comma separated. So for example, like this one, um, instead of the automated plugin installation uh, replacing the value, it will append values that are comma separated. And how do we know that our key is special? Well, we can specify that in our Zoe configuration YAML file. That's this new section right here, the setup.zis.parmlib.keys section. And what are we saying? We're saying that our key Zoe dot app one dot reg is a list type. So we know that we want a comma separated list. And that's about it for the demo. Um, the, this demo isn't meant to be a large summary of what the cross memory server accomplishes, but rather the uh, installation of the ZIS plugins themselves. But uh, I'll conclude the demo and I'll open up for any questions. Hey, Lenny, I love the fact that your demo of editing YAML files in the USS and manipulating through SSH, you did it through using the Zoe desktop file editor. And um, yeah, uh, that was nice. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah, classy. <laughs> you didn't just drop to SSH or ISPF. Um, cool. Yeah, you know. Honestly, the original plan, Joe, was actually to have the whole demo on the desktop. So I was going to use the web browser to also show the doc page uh, in the web browser app, but I kind of ran out of time a little bit with other work. And I it's got okay, we forgive you. It's great. It's just fantastic <laughs> to see, and the I mean the whole theme going forward as well. To see Zoe being used just for what it is boilerplate file and USS manipulation here. But to see it down to the desktop is classy. It's good, yeah. Um, so I guess my, my own feedback to this as well is, uh, Joe, that this is um, kind of the final missing piece from the old Cupid phase. That um, the the you know the the initiative to really make every part of the server pieces unified and easy to control in one place. I felt like we couldn't really get ZIF on the same level of convenience with the V1 technologies. But now that we have the unified YAML and ZWE and then component conformance criteria, this is this is finally, it finally feels like ZIF is a first class citizen due to this announcement. So I'm really happy to see it. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Thanks, Scott. I know I've worked with it's one of the Zoe conformant products that has a ZIS plugin, I think. And it's, it's, it's been, I've worked with that at banks. It's been quite hard to get installed. This is going to really help. But presumably that if this will get rolled into whatever the upcoming release of that offering is, that conformant offering as well. Nice job, yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks. All right, I'll stop sharing. Okay, thank you. Okay, next uh, uh, presentation would be Sean presenting Config uh, Manager Utility. Sure, so um, I'll, I'll also start with a brief um, recap on what's really going on here because Config Manager is something that we've been talking about for a long time and what is in 2.2 is not every single item on this page but rather is the config manager utility which 
um, can be used to accomplish items on this page through, you know, um, farther enhancements that we'll see in 2.3. So just just a recap. Um, in fact, um, I'm just going to post a recording in the chat because there's more there than I have time to explain today. But essentially, Config Manager as a utility is uh, derived from the Zoe Common C code base. It's a, it's a binary in the bin slash utils folder of uh, Zoe's servers. And um, what it can do, well, it's really just a, um, let's see here, it's this window, yeah. So it's, it's just a command line utility that um, you can give it parameters about your Zoe YAML configuration file and a schema that details what is valid for that YAML file. And then it will consume both, tell you if the YAML file is valid or if there are errors in the file, and then can spit out environment variables derived from the YAML file. Now, um, there's a lot more that you can do here beyond just that, but that's the basics. Um, one thing that you can do is you can uh, include multiple Zoe YAML files so that you can aggregate them together if you have, you know, default and override, perhaps. Um, you can even have the Zoe YAML be stored in a PARMLib instead of a USS file. So, so this gives you flexibility of where the Zoe YAML file lives and, and, how, uh, and how you want to split up its protections. Um, but it gives you that ability to validate them so that you'll know if your server is correct before you start it. So we're going to be using this tool in 2.3 as an opt-in for the ZWB command line utility where all the actions that it does today could be driven by this tool. And in fact, it has a uh, mode in it in which you can say, um, do your validation given this um, script. So you can see here one of the options here is script. And that's really what we're going to be doing in 2.3 is that uh, rather than ZWE being a collection of shell scripts, we can actually run ZWE uh, from the config manager itself, which allows us to use JavaScript, not Node.js, just ECMAScript compatible JavaScript. But um, that's more for the 2.3 demo. What we can do in 2.2 with this utility is that if someone has a component in their configure.sh or start.sh file of their components, or maybe even their validate.sh, they can find the config manager in the bin slash utils folder of Zoe, and they can invoke it if they'd like to validate that the config is correct before starting it, or if they would like to load additional uh, environment variables. Um, so I've seen that there are some end users who already want to do this to uh, sort of empower their existing scripts, but we're going to see a lot, lot more in 2.3, and that's really what the, um, the demo that I linked in the chat, that's more about what's going to happen in 2.3. But I guess that the brief overview that I can give is um, this link details sort of the epic that we're on and uh, some of it's in 2.2, some of it's in 2.3, but the idea is um, that we're going to have, again, validation of the config file, but also that the config file could live in um, different places and um, that um, you know, you can you can aggregate it together in case, uh, for example, maybe your administrator knows that Node.js is in one place always. And so rather than you having to specify Node.js every single time that you customize your YAML file, you can have a YAML file that just talks about Node.js and you can have a list of, of such defaults. So um, in that demo that I linked, I just have a few um, timestamps that I'd like to look at really fast to show you 
what using the config manager would allow someone to do. Um, again, this is what we're going to be doing in 2.3, but, but for now, it's just sort of a preview. Um, here is uh, a command line invocation of ZWE. And there's a lot of things that you can do with ZWE, but they all require a dash C parameter for config file. Now, today, what we do with config files, we just specify a USS path to a YAML. But what config manager can do is that it can actually take a list of paths. And you see here, there's a, there's a special syntax for it where it starts with the word file and then it has parentheses. Um, the alternative to file is lib if you want it uh, to be a parm lib. Um, if you don't use a special syntax, then you're in sort of the backwards compatible behavior of it's just a Unix file path. But if you want to chain things together, you have to use a certain syntax. So what you'll see in, in this C parameter here is on the right hand side, I have what I would consider to be my Zoe defaults. Maybe, maybe it's what comes out of the box. But then in my file to the left, I have my customizations.yaml. So it would be the the difference, the uh, you know, what am I putting on top of it? So um, within uh, these Zoe.yaml configuration files, the config manager can also process templates. And this is something that, um, you know, Jakob came up with this idea of a um, double curly uh, brace thing that you could put into the YAML file that would be substituted. So we, we incorporated that into the config manager where you can see um, at the top here, Zoe set up data set prefix. Well, if prefix is supposed to be used for the Parm11 JCL lib, rather than typing it two more times, I can actually state the prefix by reference of a template. And um, so that can make it so that these config files don't need as much edits when you go to change something. You can see halfway down the screen, there's a um, key store reference where the prefix to the key store is the pkcs12 directory so that you know it, it's going to make it easier to update your config files without having to change absolutely everything if there's multiple references to the same thing um, one of the other things that you can do with the config manager is uh, let me skip ahead to um, the validation part. What what does it look like when you try to do validation? So, um, I just have a very simple but but realistic end user um, typo that you could make. So, over on the left hand side of this config, we have a key store type. Um, it should say type pkcs12. But what if someone typoed and accidentally said PCKCS12? You know, um, that's not a valid value, and therefore the servers would have some problem. Would they crash? Would they refuse to start? Who knows? But rather than getting to the servers running and then finding out that mistake, it would be better to find that mistake as soon as possible. So, uh, in Zoe, we now have shipping in, in 2.2, actually, um, schema files. And uh, in fact, I believe Carson is doing an innovation week thing of, of trying to automate putting these schema files into the um, more user-friendly docs.zoe.org format. But, uh, but today, schema files are actually part of a JSON schema spec. And uh, it's a little bit verbose, but it digs down into every property of Zoe.yaml and says, you know, um, this property better be a string, and here's its description, or this one better be an object. And it, uh, you know, it, they all have certain properties. So when we look for that PKCS12 that I said the user might typo, we see here that type um, is a string. And it has an enum of PKCS12 or um, the Rackf key store. So um, 
if you specify anything else there, you better get an error before the servers find out the hard way that you specified something that isn't usable. So if I just skip through this a second here, when the server actually starts up, or rather when ZWE starts up rather than actually starting up the servers, what it should do and, and will do in 2.3 uh, by using this config manager utility is um, it's just gonna give you a printout very quickly at the bottom here. You can see it says validation of file, my file path against schema, that schema that I just showed on GitHub found invalid JSON schema data. And then it drills down into this tree here validity exceptions at slash Zoe, slash certificate, slash key store, slash type. And then it goes, oh, no matching enum value at Zoe certificate key store type. So someone seeing that could um, go over to the schema or eventually the docs.zoe.org and see, oh, that's why, because I could only specify this or that, and I specified something else. So these are sort of the features that we can look forward to in 2.3, but all of the capabilities that drive this are in that config manager uh, binary that are present in 2.2. So, so extenders could probably leverage this for their own purposes and that's why i'm calling out that it's in 2.2 but the actual zwe making use of it will be a 2.3 thing so i'll be back again in a few weeks to give you a demo of that um i i recommend that you check out the recording if you want to know more but otherwise um any questions on that Hey, Sean, less of a question, but it's it's just awesome. Palmlib, um, ability to segment up the zoe.yaml comment the content, ability to um, prefix, so it doesn't have to be so verbose, and you know you can have things declared once and carried forward. All looks amazing. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of my favorite things about it is um, from a from an end user side, or, or should I say from a component developer side of things, um, some of the web UI tools accumulated a maze of conditional behaviors trying to be compatible with too many different versions of Zoe. And um, turns out that this ability to do templating will be able to take all of our complicated, messy logic and make it uh, visible in Zoe.yaml as very simple statements. So, sort of, we will be making the implicit weird knowledge that I have in my brain more on paper that the end users would be able to see. So, I'm excited to have that in a in a near future Zoe version. Yeah, another component that, that does an excellent job at that is the API mediation layer, the application.yaml files, right? Because you can declare yep. a value as being, um, you know, the ID, the path of something else in the application.yaml, and then you can even dash D it into the, um, the Java command as well to override it. So that's to pass in the value externally that then comes internally and gets copied forward. So uh, it's, yeah, it's really nice when, when the sweet spot of the racket is hit. That works really well. It's great. I, I love using that in application. Yeah. yeah. Looking forward to it. Cool. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It's, a, it's quite like that. All right. Well, back to you, Nick. All right. Thank you, Sean. Okay. Next presenter would be Adarsh uh, from the Web UI Squad, Code Editor and File Tree Enhancements. Hi guys. I cannot share my screen somehow. It says like host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, try it now. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. So 
I hope you are seeing the correct screen like with the presentation. Uh, uh, we can see, no, we can see, your, the yeah, the desktop. Okay. Desktop, right. so what about now? Cool. Now we see it. Okay, cool, thanks. So yeah, so um, so there are like a few features that were added in like Zilux editor and file tree, and there was a one specific uh, bug fix that was fixed in uh, last release. Uh, so earlier, like we had no option like to right click a uh, directory in a file tree to create a file. So I have added that one. And the other one is like, uh, when there is a specific file already exists uh, in the USS system, then the user will get a warning that the file is already there. Do you want to overwrite it or not? And the third feature that I added was like, um, when a file is opened in editor and then we delete that file from the file tree, um, then the user will now uh, get the file closed from the editor side as well. And uh, previously it was it remained open, like even though the file was deleted from the file tree. And the fourth one is uh, we couldn't copy the uh, file to the same destination or to some other destination where the same named file already exists. So this new feature will um, allow the user to copy the file to the same destination or to some other destination and rename the file accordingly if the file already uh, exists. And uh, the, sorry, uh, this is uh, repeating. Okay, so and the last one is like bug fix. So when we were opening a file or a data set from a file tree and then we were trying to open the same data set or file from menu option, then the file uh, will uh, like used to get empty in the editor because the editor couldn't recognize that it is the same file that is already opened. So let me do the demo for these ones. Uh, so the first feature was like a creative file, like uh, there is an option that got added. Uh, so just choose the directory and you can choose this option, create a file. Uh, you can name it, your file and it will get created here and the second option is like uh, if we try to sorry something wrong with the editor maybe caching so if i try to uh, save this file oops my bad let me maybe something my with my code like i'm using development uh, code to present so if i try to save this one and uh, there is a file that is already there with the same name. And if I try to save it, oh, my bad session ID, let me reload it. It was open from a long time. Sorry, guys. So if I try to save this, I don't. So you will see that the file, uh, it will give you the warning that the file is already there. And uh, do you want to overwrite or not? So you can choose the option, yes or no accordingly. And uh, so if this file is already open, like new one is already open here, like if I close this one, if I delete this one, then the file should be removed from the open side of the editor. And uh, and the other one was like uh, copying the file to the same destination. Let's copy this one and try to paste here. So it will create a, a new file with and add a copy. And if I try to um, paste again, so it will create a new file with copy to and so on. If we delete this one, so it, it won't create copy three, it will create copy. So, and the other issue was like when we were opening a data set. Uh, so, so let's go here. Show you. So if I'm trying to open this data set here, like you will see the content 
And earlier, like when the user uh, was trying to open the same data set for using the menu option, and then the user was uh, seeing like empty data set, the content from this editor, like uh, used to be uh, get removed. Right now, like we, we can see the same content. So yeah, so that's uh, the features that were added and bugs fixes that were like uh, merged in the last release. That's it. Yeah, any questions? No, Adash, that looks great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. yeah, it looks good. Yeah, it's nice fit and finish. It's good to see the Zerianita really, really moving forward. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I will stop sharing. All right. Thanks, Adash. So that's it for what I have on the agenda. Are there any other squads that would like to present anything? Uh, yeah, I think I was to watch uh, that in PVG. Uh, as it is an app, you know, we have a new product, uh, the great new product that we are developing now, and as we can uh, demonstrate uh, our product. Yeah. Yeah, I could uh, share my screen for now. Uh, could I, yeah, uh, could, could you please uh, enable screen sharing for me? <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Uh, so here we go. <clears throat> I hope you can see my screen for now. Uh, so what we are talking about here, it's uh, our new development like uh, Jenkins uh, ZS DevOps plugin uh, on which we are working for now. So which uh, currently using Zoe SDK inside. Uh, so here i just want to show you our live demo how it works and how it looks like and uh, our current status of this plugin uh, so here for now our plugin are not store under jenkins uh, jenkins hub repository so you could uh, install it only by uh, by install uh zs devops gpa model so it's look like something uh, for example, manage Jenkins, uh, manage plugins, advanced, and just like drag and drop here, deploy. And yes, uh, plugin is already installed. So it's uh, the latest version installed in our Jenkins server. It's uh, just a limitation just for now. So instead, uh, in case we didn't yet uh, post it, uh, our plugin in Jenkins Hub. Uh, so how it looks like, uh, we prepared a small uh, Jenkins file with uh, declarative pipeline syntax. Uh, it's a simple pipeline with uh, some stages. Uh, which we called uh, git checkout from where we download all our zeros related sources just for example here uh, this is our jenkins plugin pipeline repo just for example with some files like uh, assembler program and so on uh, and here we go uh, we download our jenkins file uh, also executed and uh, here what our pipeline do is um, some steps uh, as you can see under the comments so we didn't uh, yet develop uh, this functionality but uh, we decided to place it here just for visibility and for better understanding how it how it would looks like uh, so the first step uh, we upload sources from git for example, uh, using this command zsmf uh, and choose our zsmf ad connection. So uh, regarding this connection type here in configure system in Jenkins, uh, after we in, uh, in already installed our uh, Jenkins zsdops plugin. So here 
in configure system page, you can find uh, Zeus connection list. Uh, place it here. Uh, just name it like Zeus MF AD. So like this, uh, we called it. So it's already stored in Jenkins. Uh, place URL for your uh, mainframe on which uh, you want to connect and place credentials uh, to log on. So also you can add another one machine and so on. Uh, so again, back to our Jenkins file. So um, here step, step for, for example, uh, we call ZSMF a D connection, which uh, was already saved in uh, Jenkins configure system. Uh, and we upload files, uh, for example, from Linux system where our Jenkins server running uh, to directory, for example, on USS site. After that, we decide to submit job without sync. So uh, we already developed uh, two methods, uh, like submit job uh, without sync and submit job with sync. So in the first case, we we won't wait in it completion. And another one, of course, we waited completion with the term code. Uh, so for example, just uh, we submit some job, which uh, just for example, start um, maybe compile object model, uh, after that compile load module. And after that, uh, when we get a load module uh, on the stage transfer that set into a production environment, we download, for example, this load model to another LPAR. So, and uh, in the future, it will look also like this. We call ZSMF, based here our saved connection, call method transfer data set from the directory target LPAR and to DIR. And just for uh, its for visibility. So, how it looks like in action, uh, just for example. So here we go. Uh, we decided to place uh, the most part of interaction with uh, DevOps at all and the pipeline uh, into IntelliJ IDEA. So uh, mainframe developer, for example, like me, uh, open source code files like this, uh, add something uh, like new, new code line. Uh, after that, he commit, commit it, commit and push. And here in Jenkins control plugin, I refresh here our demo pipeline, which will start it now and triggered uh, by push commit, started by GitLab push. And here we go. So submit a job from file. So it uh, it was two call uh, two methods call without uh, without waiting job completion and this one we wait job completion waiting for a job finish job was finished return code zero zero uh, and just for example in mainframe plugin we could find just explorer as you can see here uh i'm sorry forget just uh, to prove myself that <laughs> i didn't uh, execute this gcl jobs by my hands so refresh and here we have uh previously currently executed gcl jobs with related jobs id for example, job 3109, here it is, 108107, 107, 108. So, and here it looks like this. So from Intelish idea, we could uh, just trigger a pipeline. It will execute automatically. And here in stack with uh, Jenkins control plugin, we could see uh, execution logs. We could trigger pipeline also manually by our hands. And from, from mainframe plugin also, we could see 
uh, the jobs which we are also running, just for example, open job one. It's like demo dummy GCLs, which we previously executed. And here in Just Explorer, we see that they successfully executed. And yeah, demo pipeline. Yeah, it's all executed successfully. And that's it. Also, we have uh, we developed uh, freestyle uh, job support for uh, execution methods. So it would be nice for newcomers and uh, new DevOps engineers which uh, just started uh, our, uh, their journey with Jenkins, for example, and uh, they are not completely um, understand how to write uh, like. Uh, like uh, some Jenkins files uh, with the Jenkins uh, pipeline declarative syntax. So it would be nice for them uh, with uh, already prepared fields and uh, helpers and so on. So I think that's all what I want to share with you. And maybe you have some questions. <laughs> Hey, yeah, so I have some questions. It's it's great. I, it's really good to see the IntelliJ work. I really love that. It's a really good sort of um, a kind of cousin to the VS Code work. So you have an extension there called, um, is this all within the Zoe Explorer extension or do you have another extension loaded in, into IntelliJ to make this work? Uh, just for now, we use uh, Zoe Explorer. Uh, it's it's no matter for main frame it's uh, the same as the explorer uh, but uh, this is uh, our internal branding. Oh, it's your internal one. Got it. Okay, that's yeah. confusing me a little bit. Yeah, because when I got in, it in the, the marketplace, it's it's just the explorer. Exactly. Okay. All right. I was just a little confused when I saw. It. I went to yeah. search for it to see if maybe it was a separate one. Okay, that's great. Um, I love the fact that you were showing the um CI/CD pipeline as well. I wonder if that's um, the actual Jenkins scripts. I wonder if that's something that you're thinking about making available on github.com slash Zoe, or you're perhaps thinking about writing an article about on medium.com slash Zoe, or putting it in the Zoe documentation, um, just making it more accessible from Zoe, because it's lovely to see use cases around DevOps. Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. <laughs> so we just in the beginning of development. So uh, we we decided to develop also some new features. For example, currently we are working on uh, declarative data set download, declarative final upload, uh, and getting GCL jobs execution logs. So uh, after the completion uh, of the pipeline, you could just, for example, open your uh, workspace, for example, and here you can find uh, your GCL jobs outputs. So oh, we nice. decided do not uh, post it in uh, the whole uh, the whole build uh, console output because uh, it uh, like take a lot of place here. <laughs> so we decided to place just only like here. You could click on the link. You open a file. In the workspace with the downloaded GCL job output, just for example, like this, open here and see the uh, GCL job output, something like that. Do not post it uh, in a whole console output because it's really take a lot of space. So yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, my, my this is great. My question was more. If there, and it points to the earlier question we had from somebody about where they where they can find the information that we're, we're everybody's doing such a great job showing today. If somebody comes to Zoe and they say, you know, I'm an IntelliJ customer and I'm doing some CI/CD stuff with Jenkins, they're going to go to Zoe.org, they're going to go to our documentation site or our blog site. I'm just wondering what the best way is that we can help to get this content there uh, um i think we don't have uh, any publication just for now uh, no worries. But, yeah I, but, yeah 
but yeah, we can uh, we can create a repo on the Zoe uh, Zoe GitHub community, uh, and we can write an article. Uh, the... Yeah, when you're ready, reach out. There's a onboarder squad. There's a doc squad. We'd be very very happy to help you get this out so you can get more customers. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks, squad. It's great. Yeah, thank you. All. All right, thank you. Are there any other squads I would like to present? Any questions, comments? I'm surprised we had no nothing from the core Zoe Explorer squad. Maybe, maybe they're saving it up for later or I don't know, Billy, there must be something good in Tutu. Um, Hey, uh, no, we didn't sign up with anything. We have some really good stuff coming out in our next release, along with a lot of bug fixes and stuff. So we'll probably be at the next demo. Awesome, thanks. I didn't want to put you on the spot. It was great to see the desktop and IntelliJ and, and the config manager and stuff stealing their limelight today and the CLI, great CLI stuff with the new work and the comparison. Thanks. Okay, uh, if there's nothing else, um, sounds like we can end the call for today. Uh, as always, I will uh, put the meeting recordings in the Slack channel. I think Joe already sent the link, that's where it's gonna go. So stay tuned for that. That should be there in about an hour or so. Thanks everyone for joining and have a nice day. Thank you everyone. Thanks, you too, bye. Thank you, bye. See ya. Goodbye.